Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the um, to all the participants at the Zoom meeting the and, the, and the YouTube live stream to today's Samva talk by Professor S. Adagopan, our former director and the founding director of our institute. His talk is on online education, um, what we have not learned during COVID-19. This is a special talk to celebrate Teacher's Day from yesterday. Today we have none other than Professor Sal Gopan, who is the teacher of teachers, I would say, around here, to grace this occasion. Uh, with this, we also kickstart the new Samva theme on education and technology, but not to forget the last talk in the theme on a roadmap to 5G and beyond communication by Professor Sridhar is still on for next week. Um, today's session will be chaired by none other than Professor Devbrata Das, the current director of TripleITB. Uh, he had joined our faculty in 2002, prior to which he was at uh, the G.S. Sanyal School of Telecommunication at IIT Kharagpur and um, then at Kirana Networks in New Jersey, in USA. He is also an alum of IIT Kharagpur, having received his PhD from there. He is a PI and nodal officer of the project under national mission for interdisciplinary cyber physical systems in the areas of advanced communication systems from uh, DST, Government of India. Uh, he has been the co-PI, PI for several projects from industry as well as the Government of India. Uh, his research interests are in uh, wireless access networks, MAC, uh, IoT, QoS, uh, power saving and related topics on which he has widely published. Um, almost 200 publications now and ticking away, I guess. Uh, so without any further delay, I would now like to uh, invite Professor Das to introduce the speaker of the day and also to chair the session. But before handing over the stage to him, I would like to mention a few points. We will be taking the questions at the end of the talk. Please feel free to ask questions in the chat boxes in the Zoom meeting as well as uh, in YouTube Live. Um, we'll be happy to take the questions at the end. Now, Professor Das, it's your turn. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Jaya. For, uh, for your kind introduction and very meticulously organizing this Samba talks and taking the touch ahead. And so nice of you for doing this. However, today is a very significant day because uh, it is a great pleasure and honor to introduce Professor Sadagopan. And of course, uh, he doesn't need any introduction. He's a very well-known person across India and the globe, and, and he was also the director of this institute till July 2021 and contributed a lot. And he had taught earlier for many years at IIT Kanpur and Bangalore, in addition to the short term teaching assignment at IIT Madras, Rutgers in New Jersey, and also AIT in Bangkok. His research interests in operational research and multi criteria optimization in 1980s shifted to IT application in industry, government and education in the past three decades. So he has a very rich experience in the education and information technology systems. He has taught in universities around the globe and written extensively for print and online medias, all aspects of ITs. And his seven books has been released and on IT also. And I have been fortunate uh, to work with him from 2002. And I am looking forward to listen to his talk on this very pertinent area that is online education, what we have not learned from COVID-19. And thank you, Professor Sadhguppan, giving us time and also for your this presentation. Over to Professor Sadhguppan. Thank you, Professor Das. And thanks, Jaya, for inviting me. And thanks, Professor Das, for introducing. So, you know, this Samba series is a very interesting series. And if you officially translate Samba, which is actually a, not a talk, okay? It is actually a dialogue or a charcha. So in the true spirit of Samba, so I'm actually not going to be talking much. So my talk would be more like for about 20 minutes. But what I do is I will intersperse my talk with talks from three, four people one for one minute, one for three minutes, one for five minutes, etc. And the whole idea is to raise some questions. Honestly, I don't have answers to any of them, but I thought that one purpose of academic institutions is to keep raising some questions. And that is what 
I call it what we have not learned from during the COVID-19 period. So let me kind of give a couple of uh, background remarks. I have a very unusual association with this online education. So sometimes it is kind of hilarious. I still remember 1976, I landed in a town called West Lafayette in Indiana. And then three or four weeks down the line, so I was a TA for an interesting course. Three professors from three engineering departments, mechanical, electrical, chemical, teaching a course from Lafayette, Indiana to Warren, Michigan, General Motors plant. And the title of the course was engineering optimization. So idea is introducing some optimization tools and techniques for plant engineers. So interesting, right? It, the distance was about 250 miles. So that was truly, come to think of it today, a revolutionary, right? But you know, it was so interesting to see things happening even at that time. And then right at Purdue, I was also part of a project of Control Data Corporation, which was developing a system called Plato. They put almost a billion dollar on it. So kind of much of the money went down the tube, nothing much happened. But it's interesting to see that this online education is something which has been receiving some attention all through. And of course, in mid 90s, there was one unusual gentleman by name Dr. Manohan Pant, who used to be at IIT Kanpur, then he moved to IGNO. And then we both were doing a few experiments in 90s, nothing much happened. And in 2004, as part of Triple ITB, Professor Chandrasekhar has just joined. Uh, around that time, we actually became India's first to get into online entrance examination. Okay, so things have been kind of happening. I've been dabbling with this. But last 18 months have been unusual because of COVID, you know, lots of things happened. And this was also the time something called NEP happened, National Education Policy. And this policy is unusual in the sense that, you know, it happened after many decades, so there was a lot of good reception, but it was submitted towards the late half of the last Modi government. So most of us thought it will die a natural death, but surprisingly, it did not. And after coming back to power, the prime minister again took it on himself and he was actually talking about it. And after one year of NEP, he again talked to the nation about it. So in a sense that NEP is getting a lot of attention and I have been involved a little bit in NEP. So what I have been doing these last 18 months, I also been part of many, many, many webinars. Probably NEP is one policy which has inputs from so many people, unbelievable. Million suggestions were received and hundreds of talks were there. Some of them I actually talked. And most of the time I was asked to talk about the technology because that is what people associate me with. And that is where I actually ended up looking at what others are doing around the planet. And what I will do is that I will speak for a while, show a video, again speak for a while, show another video. That is how I am doing it. But I think the prime import of this talk is that while a lot has happened, a lot has not happened. And I think we got so excited with the technology the education or the learning itself took a backseat. That is my view, I could be wrong, but that is what this Sambhad is all about, okay? What is the uh, missed opportunity? And I also find that in the last 18 months, looking at so many of the talks, et cetera, you also find these extreme views, particularly I think in the whole planet in the last few years, on anything we are getting these extreme views. So the moderate views are actually taking a backseat. Okay, so there are people who really talk of cloud university and others who say that, you know, future of education is not online, but I think it is important to have a more balanced view. The next slide. Okay. So obviously this is something which you all know, there is nothing we have to talk about, but it's such an unfortunate stuff. But I thought that, you know, sometimes it is good to look at these numbers, unbelievable numbers, you know, as I just looked at the COVID dashboard of uh, WHO, 4.6 million globally and 4.3 lakhs in India. And, you know, particularly IT, education and healthcare government, these are the four segments of the, indus the industry or human activity, 
where people did not feel the punch to such an extent that none of us did all of us got our salaries throughout but it is not true in many many places that is you know to some extent you know we don't even feel the pinch of it the next slide okay and what is that impact on higher education so you remember last year march so effectively halfway through the semester or half a semester was gone and then two full semesters are gone and you know many places the semester has not started which was supposed to have started in july we are already in september we are hoping to start in september october many places we don't know but something very interesting that uh, a country like india managed to do fairly well and what is amazing is 100% of the higher education institutions were actually delivering how much we will come back to it but it's interesting to see that people rolled up their sleeves and attempted and nearly succeeded in moving 100% instruction online of course the examination is a very confusing situation there are a lot of postponements and then some of them partially conducted some of them they said you substitute with attendance some prorating so it's a muddle but nonetheless but so what happened was the instructional delivery was not too badly impacted but the assessment is badly impacted that is the message the next slide okay so this is another view i just thought i will start with this view and this was done in february 2020 but the gentleman you will hear talks about this he has been talking about it from 2012 it is a tedx talk 3 minutes okay in 2012 i was asked to speak at a tedx event in istanbul on the future of education several times throughout my talk i touched on the topic of teacherless education after my presentation i was approached by a google executive who explained why teacherless education was so important to them he said their team at google is looking for ways to educate the people of africa but very few teachers actually want to move to africa the conversation was brief but he framed the problem very succinctly no most teachers don't want to move to africa they also don't want to move to siberia to bangladesh to pakistan or the amazon rainforest there are lots of places in the world that teachers don't want to move to by some count we are short 69 million teachers globally in a full 23% of kids growing up today don't attend any school whatsoever if we continue to insert a teacher between us and everything we have to learn we cannot possibly learn fast enough to meet the demands of the future teaching requires experts teacherless education uses experts to create the material but doesn't require the expert to be present each time it's presented education is now on the verge of a major transformation and ai based teacherless education systems are quickly taking center stage If we apply AI to teacher bots their primary task will be to find the fastest way to teach students over time AIs will learn every student's interests their proclivities their idiosyncrasies preferred tools personal reference points and how to keep them engaged in learning even in the face of distractions AI will quickly learn what skills were proficient in what skills were deficient in and what's needed to bring us up to speed it will quickly learn how and when to schedule our next training and when we've mastered the topic throughout this training curve individual learning will begin to scale far faster than anything we've dreamed possible four times six times perhaps even 10 times faster than anything today completing a four year college degree in one to two months will be entirely possible with this new form of ai learning systems by creating high speed ai learning systems we remove all of our past limitations by 2030 the largest company on the internet will be an education based company that we haven't heard of yet in my mind this will be the largest opportunity in the online world where no one has quite cracked the code yet but once somebody figures it out it will scale very quickly okay so this is at least to me it is definitely an extreme view and the, okay we will discuss it towards the end but i just wanted you this is the longest one video which i will share all other things will be much shorter 
but i just want you to get a feel for it the other extreme view this is very interesting this is a february 2020 and there is a version of it little later somehow i could not get access to it yesterday i have just tried but you know particularly this is from north america and this is very student driven so what i want you to note is you see the reason why i am doing this particular format is this is something which is my own learning in the last one and a half years so a lot of the talks instead of you talking you use some snippets from here and there and because the snippets have full link so later on the readers can go back and even go back to the full video etc so this is how i have been doing it so what happens is this particular this is actually a piece on higher inter, inside higher education magazine and uh, it uses a very strong uh, words again it clear here it is the other extreme online learning is not the future never it was never it will be it is just not what the students want okay this is one view i you have seen the earlier view was that everything is online the largest company will be an online company effectively finishing off the current level set of higher education institutions that seems to be one extreme view this seems to be another extreme but i found that recently there was a far more balanced view which i thought was resonating with my view and my feeling is probably many of you will resonate go to the next slide this is the vice chancellor of op jindal university very unusual gentleman and uh, op jindal you all know is one of the first to get this uh, institute of eminence uh, tag which is an unusual one our own uh, colleague uh, uh, professor vyasulu was uh, uh, professor vinod kasu yes sir practically yes sir vinod kasu was in there yes uh, mr 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 sirach tumaru started this university 11 years back and you invested in physical infrastructure technology faculty and associated aspects today we are in a post pandemic or in a pandemic era if you to invest a similar amount of money uh do you think it is possible to build a university on the cloud uh do we really need physical infrastructure uh a word that is being used in education a lot is hybrid uh, give us a sense of what are your thoughts looking 3 to 5 years ahead so oh, thank you very much uh, dr batra it's a very important question that people are asking around the world so first of all i want to make a distinction between undergraduate education on the one hand and then masters education on the other and also professional education and continuing education which is also equally important as far as the undergrad education is concerned which is what we are 85% of our students pursue undergraduate programs which is the uh, bulk of our programs including most of our students study ug programs they are high school students coming into jindal to pursue a whole range of programs in the 12 different schools that we are in undergrad settings i am of the view that there is a very strong and compelling need for a campus ecosystem the brick and mortar campus environment and its own imagination is absolutely essential not only because of the fact that the learning outcomes are and the pedagogical approach towards learning is best condition you know in those environment but also the peer group interaction the ability to uh, engage with each other understand each other understand the society at large through observing and participating all those aspects which are undertaken best in a more physical context simply cannot match uh, or even substitute uh, what happens in a virtual context having said that i am a strong votary and supporter of expanding our engagement through Uh, MOOCs and all forms of uh, online and higher education, including uh, the kind of master's degrees that we are offering to Coursera and Upgrad, but also other forms. The third area where I think a lot of expansion is possible is continuing education or, or executive education or professional education, which is a neglected aspect in India in any any profession. Uh, for example if you look at a typical uh, united states uh, professional law or uk professional they are continuously involved in education 
educational project does not stop at the end of an undergraduate or a master's degree when they leave the portals of an institution. They are constantly upgrading themselves. They are constantly getting into short-term courses, long-term courses, immersion programs and things like that, which I believe can work best in those conditions using the technology. Lastly, I would say, even when physically we open the campus in a more in a post-pandemic world, I do believe that what the pandemic has taught us is we should move into hybrid education anyways, meaning that with, along with the physical campus environment, a lot of courses and opportunities should also be created so that students can engage and interact with faculty members from around the world and in online settings too. In fact, one of the remarkable outcomes of this is that if our governments, uh, you know, step up their effort and improve the quality of, you know, uh, internet and electricity and all of that, we genuinely have an opportunity to democratize education and create greater forms of access to education for a larger number of people in India because everybody cannot afford higher education the kind of education that we would probably offer. Okay, so that was a quick, a balanced view, and at least I could resonate, of course, you know, O.P. Jindal and uh, Triple ITB, we had done a few things together, and uh, I think O.P. Jindal used Triple ITB as a kind of a benchmarking point, because when they tied up with upgrad, so we did something together also. So I found that this was a more balanced view. We'll come back to it when we take up this question. The next one is something which I kind of quite a learning for me. One of the things which I felt was missing in the whole thing was we were discussing a lot about the bandwidth, the devices, you know, how do we reach the laptops and the mobiles and how do we get them special connects, etc. But I think not much that was actually the main point of my today's Sambad team also that possibly what we have not learned. I think there has been too much emphasis on technology and much less emphasis on learning. So I was kind of looking at who are the people who are looking at the learning. And then you all know that IAMB runs a center for uh, teaching and learning. Professor uh, Joe's who had come and given a talk has been kind of uh, driving the center. And just about a month back or month, two months back, Professor Sanjay Sharma, you know, most people know Sanjay as uh, RFID man, but he has been kind of spending a lot of time in learning. So I found that this is a little longish video. So some of you who are interested can take a look at it. So I'm just using about 17 minutes or 14 minutes of this. Okay. So the idea is that we kind of talks about how the education, particularly the higher education or the university education has evolved. So it gives a little historical perspective for the first couple of minutes. It is a little longish, but nonetheless, it is very valuable. The other snippets are much shorter, going a little bit into neuroscience where he has been writing a book and then the evolution of the lecture format and the learning and most important stuff. This is to me the most important part of today's talk also. I think Sanjay's view of what online and in-person can do together and what is that we can learn because one of the most important things to me, it has been a quite a learning for myself included, including this format. See, video format, you know, simply doing a Zoom session is not something which is exciting to me. It gets very boring. And I actually pity the students who sit through it for 45 hours for a course and they're to doing four courses. Because just talking to your screen or talking even in a classroom can, without any human beings there, can be terrible. Okay. So Sanjay talks of how we can incorporate online and in-person together. And one of my requests at the end of this talk today is going to be that hopefully when things are back to normal, we should not simply go back to what we were doing. I think we ought to learn from this COVID-19 days and then there are a few learnings should actually be put back. So that is the reason why I am uh, putting these slides. Okay, start with the basics. In the real world, it is a pleasure to introduce Professor Sanjay Sarma. Vice President for Open Learning at MIT. He is also the Fred Ford Flowers and Peter Ford Flowers Professor of Mechanical Engineering at MIT. Since 2012, 
Professor Sarma has served as MIT's Director of Digital Learning, Dean for Digital Learning, and now Vice President of Open Learning. In these roles, he has led the creation of the MicroMasters program credential, developed the MIT Integrated Learning Initiative, founded the Jamil World Education Lab, and created a group that seeks to transform teaching and learning throughout the world through research, curriculum development, community building, and innovative learning offerings. Currently, Professor Sarma serves on the board of edX, the not-for-profit company founded by MIT and Harvard to create and promulgate an open source platform for the distribution of free online education worldwide. He also advises several national governments and global companies. A very good morning, Sanjay. I now hand over the screen to you for the keynote address. Thank you very much, uh, Deepthi. Uh, I'm going to begin by sharing my screen, which is the most risky aspect of a presentation. And uh, if I can pull that off, I can steam on. Can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Great, thanks. Uh, do you see people waving? It means that it's in display mode. Great. Okay. Um, look, it's such a pleasure to um, to speak to you. Um, let me start by saying that you know the way we educate today is in some sort of uh, scientific uh, technique that was given to us uh, as a gift from God in some holy book, nor is it based particularly on science. A lot of our teaching comes by happenstance. Um, you know, actually the oldest education institution we know is uh, Takshila, Takshashila, which is of course in Pakistan, then Nalanda and so on. Uh, those um, uh, traditions uh, are somewhat lost, uh, although many of them survive in Indian culture. Um, but then um, Islamic and then um, Christian universities, Islam, the Islamic, the oldest extant university by some measures is in Morocco, uh, Al Qarawain, and then uh, Christian monasteries uh, became the uh, place where universities started. We still, of course, have the Buddhist monastic tradition. Um, and, um, and then uh, actually there was a system that came out of um, India called the Madras system, which people in Madras don't know about. Um, and it was copied by uh, the British and became the Lancaster system. Meanwhile, the Industrial Revolution was taking off, and you had to find some way to educate the kids. Uh, there's some, hist uh, I think, false history that somehow our, industri our um, entire education system was designed to look like a factory. It's not completely true, but there's elements of that that are true. The fact of the matter is you had to put the kids somewhere, and so they put them in a factory mode uh, <clears throat> education system. But the most important lesson to take away from that is the thing to do in a factory is to make products and to test them. And that became an essential aspect of our education system, just testing. Now, fast forward to 2021, 20, uh, post COVID. Um, even before COVID, the gig economy was taking off. You know, it started with simple tasks, you know, with grocery delivery, ride sharing. But then over time, it is extending to more and more cognitively demanding tasks like tutoring. Um, and then <clears throat> um, uh, we now know that post COVID, it isn't as if people are going to be um, climbing over each other. Companies aren't going to be recruiting uh, and expanding greatly. Um, the expectation is they'll ex they will hire freelancers because the more gives them more flexibility. Human be are uh, all around the world. People have also changed, um, and so the gig economy is going to take off. And this is a report from Gartner from a couple of years ago on. Um, you know, if you look at the uh, various job categories, how much of it is going to be gig, and you can see that as you move to uh, more and more cognitively demanding tasks, the numbers are actually beginning to creep up, and this is an international phenomenon. What that means is that it is no longer the case that you're simply educating students so that they can get a, a degree from you, a chapa, you know, as they say in Hindi, so that they can go apply for a job. Increasingly, you're going to have to prepare people to become the chief learning officers, the chief uh, executive officers, the chief marketing officers of their own lives. It doesn't matter whether you graduate from IIM or some other university, that only matters for your first gig. Now, your third, fifth, seventh gig will be judged by how well you did on your previous gig. It's like a, uh, an Amazon or a uh, uh, eBay rating, you know? And um, that means that we cannot have an education system where we are trimming people to become interchangeable. I mean, you could argue that the crowning glory of the uh, industrial revolution was to make interchangeable parts. I would argue 
Okay, that is a short okay take on Sanjay's view. A little bit how the higher education has shaped and how things are going. And already a lot of talk to me. It is a lot of noise than signal, but nonetheless, that uh, you know you kind of uh, you don't need a degree, but as long as you have the skill, I can give a job, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But okay, but I thought let us kind of go a little deeper. And then next three minutes will be a little bit on what Sanjay's take, because this is something on which he has written a book now, broadly the neuroscience. The next snippet, please. And why this is the case. Um, but I won't go too much into neuroscience because that's a rat hole and it's beautiful, but we'll spend all our time there. So this is um, an image of the human brain, obviously. And the front part is called the prefrontal cortex, BFC, the PFC. And, there's a reason that uh, some cultures, like in India, we call it the third eye, we, <clears throat> you know, we have Bindis and Tilaks and so on. <clears throat> and the reason is that it's a recognition that the prefrontal cortex is something very special. By the way, animals don't have it, we do. And it only grows in between ages 18 and 20 something. That's why, you know, we don't let young people drive or drink for that reason. The PFC is effectively the CEO of the brain and it gives a regulation, uh, it regulates uh, emotion, um, um, you know, the body, morality, uh, determination, all that comes from the PFC. A lot of these things we've discovered from accidents and from wars because people get uh, horrifically um, uh, injured and some function goes away and then we go, oh, that's where hearing occurs, that's where speech occurs. And the PFC was discovered through a, uh, uh, an accident that a man called Phineas Gates suffered and he had an injury to his, you know, to his forehead. And he lost all, he became an irresolute human being after being a very sensible guy. And so now we know what the PFC does. And of course, now it's being proven in other ways, which I'll show you. We also know the limbic uh, portion of the brain. This is the reward system, the fight, flight, freeze response. Um, emotions um, are related to the limbic system um, and the amygdala, which is um, uh, a place uh, near the, in that area where the limbic system resides. And then this thing on the right is called the hippocampus. Um, it looks, it's called a hippocampus uh, because it looks like a seahorse, uh, but that's where we know memories are formed. Uh, we know that because in the 50s, a man called Hilary Molaison had epilepsy, so they removed his hippocampus, and they found that he couldn't form short-term memories anymore. So all these things have led to some amazing discoveries. And over the last 30, 40 years, we've begun to learn um, more about the brain because of things like functional MRI and diffusion tensor imaging uh, and so on. And so... Now you can put a patient in an MRI machine. It turns out that when the blood rushes to a part of the brain, um, that blood is oxygen rich because you're using that part of the brain. So let's say you're playing music and a certain part of the brain lights up. More blood will carry oxygen there. And oxygen is weakly repelled or oxygen rich. Hemoglobin is weakly repelled by a magnetic field. So by doing some fancy uh, image processing, you can figure out tomography actually, which part of the brain is lighting up for what activity. So through that, we're able to form somewhat more Okay, so thank you. So that the idea is that what Sanjay does well is that he kind of connects this neuroscience. We will see the next one will be a little bit about the lecture format. Remember, the core of university education is the lecture format, right? So he actually talks about what is the thought process behind the lecture format. In the next module, he will kind of connect the little bit of the neuroscience and what we try to do in the lecture format, okay? So go to the next lecture format. So this is a picture I grabbed it from Wikipedia um, about uh, 10 years ago. And of course now people are showing this everywhere, which is good because the point is that this is a painting from 1308 and it's a lecture. And the lecture format has survived at least 700 years. I wonder if any of these uh, folks uh, in the classroom, one of whom you can see is um, sleeping off a late night and the other of whom is uh, distracted by his uh, Instagram account, right, went on to become Michelangelo. Michelangelo, on the other hand, never attended a lecture. Now, Leonardo never attended a lecture. So why is it the lecture format is so resilient? It's because there is a fundamental misunderstanding that we all conveniently hold, um, and it's a convenience, that somehow the brain is a sheet of paper, the mind of the student is a sheet of paper, and the professor has a pen. And all the professor has to do is write on a sheet of paper and declare victory. And the science tells us, and basic uh, logic tells us, nothing could be further from the truth. The fact is, you as a human being, as a learner, are formulating a model of the world. 
It's like a plant growing. When you need water, you need water. You need potassium, you need potassium. You need nitrogen, you need nitrogen. You can't just give a plant all the water of its, it'll need in its life on day one and declare victory. But that's sort of how we do um, education, right? We teach math 101. And you should be good with math. But of course, you forget math. And you need it when you need it. And then you don't recall it. And we wag a finger and say, look, I already wrote it on your mind. How could you forget? But as I'll tell you, forgetting is an essential mechanism in, in, uh, in learning. And we have made no space for it. So um, the fact is, the way we construct a model of the world is like this. We, um, you know, you have uh, little nuggets of knowledge. Um, you can only eat little morsels. That's a crazy thing. People, and every parent knows this, by the way. Just look at the way you treat your children. And children are evolved to learn. And that same evolutionary instinct applies to adults, including people of our age. Um, certainly my age. The point is that it doesn't change. It's the same evolutionary instinct. So the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus, they play uh, together. And what they do is when the information comes in little nuggets, uh, I put it in the form of this leprechaun. Um, and the leprechaun fills up a tiny little cauldron, runs back, has to reformat the information to make it useful, right? And then reorganize it into the treasury that's your mind so that at a later date, when you need that information, you can use it. So that is a quick take on, you know, what is that we are trying to do in a typical classroom kind of education? And of course, you know, obviously I am jumping the slide. So you will find that certain things probably are kind of jumped. So I'm sorry about it. But I just want, thought that within a short time, I want you to get this import. So you can always take a look at this full video. And then what he does in the next three minutes is to kind of connect you know, a little bit of the neuroscience and a little bit of what happens in the uh, uh, lecture format. Okay, so the next is a snippet, please. Uh, particularly GRASP, which is a science of learning. And then more recently, um, uh, this year, we wrote a book on workforce education on the future of learning. So uh, the key principles, I won't go through them all, but I'll give you a, a taste of them. And I'm going fast, forgive me, but um, uh, you'll have my slides um, and you can, um, I'm happy to share them. I'm violating my own principles, but such is our fate in uh, Zoom world. Um, so mind wandering, I just mentioned it to you. It's when, you know, when you're focusing, you can see that the brain, you can see all the activities concentrated in these points A and B. Um, um, but then when you aren't able to concentrate, meta-awareness means when you, it's a form of mindfulness, you can, you, can, you can control the mind wandering. If you don't, it's all over the place, right? Mind wandering sets in after about 10 minutes of learning. Yet every lecture in every classroom in the world is at least 45 minutes, one hour, 90 minutes. So I can assure you that the remaining 20 minutes, the remaining 50 minutes, the remaining um, one hour and 20 minutes is wasted because the student does something worse than learn. The student develops false familiarity. They don't actually learn. They don't, they don't actually grok it. Um, so here's a sort of a complicated graph, but I'll explain it to you simply, okay? So it, this gentleman, by the way, is Herman Ebbinghaus. It's actually rather profound. So what he did was, just, you know, uh, ignore the graph for a second. He uh, locked himself in an attic in Paris 140 years ago. He's considered probably the first great psychologist, um, although I would argue that Patanjali was a great psychologist. But anyway, so he um, would lock himself and he would um, memorize random words and then see how he forgot them, right? How he could recall them. And what he discovered is something rather profound. He found that when you learn it the first time, you know, learn, um, let's say, 100 words, 100%, right? You're down to 50 words um, very quickly. You forget 50 words. But then if you're reminded and you go back to 100%, the second time you forget slowly, and the third time more slowly, and the fourth time more slowly, and the fifth time more slowly. So what he essentially said is that forgetting is an essential part of learning. And the reason for that evolutionarily is you actually had a lot of um, inputs this morning before you came into work this afternoon. I know it's evening there, right? You had a lot of inputs. It would be mind-bogglingly useless for you to remember all that. So the brain has to figure out some way to understand what to remember. And the way it understands what to remember is the things that are repeated. It's called a low-pass filter for those of you who know signal processing. So it turns out forgetting is essential in learning. And it's even better if you are reminded just as you're about to get rusty with something, you're more likely to remember it longer. Uh, and by the way, this is uh, used in all the language programs, you know, Rosetta, all those things, but no professors know about it. 
But yet, what do we do when a student forgets? We wave a finger at them and say, how dare you forget? Because damn it, your mind is a sheet of paper I wrote on it. How could you forget, right? You never do that to your kid. You know that your kid, you actually instinctively know as a parent not to do that. But we do that in the classroom. Why? It's the same evolutionary principle. So if you take uh, some of those lessons and um, you can put them this way, there's a nice uh, slide from Clark Quinn. If you learn slowly, you may not do as well on the day of the test, but you'll remember longer. If you cram before the test, you will do better on the day of the test. But the memories are gone because this is regurgitative. This is imbibing. The red is regurgitative and the green is imbibing. Okay. I mean, if you, it's like a hot dog eating contest. You know, the next day, the guy's going to, you know, throw it up, right? You don't actually put on weight. It's the same thing. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, Sanjay has a whole bunch of stuff, but, you know, I just wanted you to get a glimpse of it. And we'll have the last two, two minutes segment where he ties in his um, neuroscience, little bit of the, his own views of lecture format and learning. And what does it mean for an online learning vis-a-vis -vis in person learning and where we are actually going wrong. Okay, so the last snippet, please. So they will learn better. That's what embodied cognition is beautiful. It has to do with how the motor cortex gets engaged. So we know all these principles. Now, how do we teach today? The way we teach today is we have all these principles. I haven't gone through all of them. For example, I mentioned coaching and passing, I mentioned hands on learning, curiosity. But anyway, we have all these principles. The way we teach today is we do only lectures in our on-site classrooms. That's it, right? Why? It's actually pretty good for exams and it's convenient. And we have this convenient, self-consistent of completely displaced and removed from the reality of learning, right? Um, Savita, go ahead. It's okay, Savita, we can come back then, okay? On this, okay, let's come back. So um, how should we teach, right? Oh, by the way, I should say that, and all the stuff we don't do, we just ignore it because the classroom time is taken up by these one-way lectures. Now, COVID actually did something bad to us because what we did in COVID was we just took this bad practice and we put it on Zoom. And Zoom has neither the uh, upside of um, in-person connection and nor is it good online education. Good online education is this. Translation. Universal genetic code, ribosomes, all very stuff. This time we're going to talk about the variations of the So it turns out that. Oops, so I just wanted to pause that. So this gentleman is Eric Lander. He's one of the, he, he's actually in the White House now. He's the uh, um, President Biden's chief, he's an MIT professor, chief scientific advisor. And uh, he is one of, led one of the two teams that sequence the human genome. Look at this. Okay, you can pause it. You can rewind it. If your mind wanders, you can go back. You have text here. A lot of students watch it 2x if they know it so they can adapt to it, right? This is good online. This is not. And by the way, this is what we do with edX. And of course, IIT, uh, Bang um, I am Bangalore is a member of uh, edX as well. Um, so the problem with Zoom, the Zoom lectures, we did the worst of both worlds. <laughs> Neither this nor good lecturing or good classroom practice. It's terrible, actually. So people think we did, or we learned about um, from our COVID. We didn't. We learned what not to do. The only thing we learned was the convenience of, of not having to be, you know, in two places at the same time. So the way we must teach in the future is lectures must go online. And a lot of the things that retrieval effects, space repetition that you can do in the classroom, you can actually do better online. Right? And that's basically what the edX software uh, enables. And by the way, the future of edX, you've probably heard about this big edX transaction, the nonprofit piece of edX, the uh, edX.org. This is what we're going to focus on. And then in the classroom, you should be focusing on this, coaching, the curiosity, the hands-on learning, the field trips, et cetera, et cetera. And that's going to take gumption. And that's going to take a lot of us changing our practices. When we have the honor and the privilege of being back together in the classroom, we better make it count. 
So I'll, I won't bore you too much more. I'll just say that, um, you know, this is what we've done at MIT. Uh, we launched open course where actually I was in. That gave you a glimpse. I particularly found it was a kind of uh, very interesting because I thought that somebody has gone deep into this whole thing of online education. And of course, we will have a discussion. So kind of if I have to like kind of summarize, okay, what happened was we had the two extreme views. One set of people saying that, look, cloud university will finish off all the universities. We don't need so many of them. The other one saying that, look, no, the students just don't like it. it they hate it. So I think it is just terrible. Not the future of education forever. But I, then you have something in between. I love Raja Kumar essentially talking about how undergraduate education will be primarily class-based education, in-person education, whereas executive education can go online. That seems to be more a pragmatic view. And then Sanjay coming and telling a lot more details with a fair amount of research. Then I actually found that, you know, that Subhashitas are the old proverbs, you know, so nice things from the good old days. So this is something which, at least in the traditional community, this is widely known, but not widely known to the rest of the world. I'll just read it out. Very simple. Acharya, Pada Madhate. Pada is one fourth. One fourth is what you learn from the instructor, typically in a class. Padam Sishya Swamedhaya. The other quarter you learn from your own uh, intellect, essentially doing homework, etc. Padam sab brahmachari bihi. The other one fourth is what you learn from your classmates, doing projects, doing group projects, or maybe uh, the, the final year projects, etc. And most interesting, kalena padam adate. The remaining 25% will happen through over period of time in your life. So don't expect the learnings to be all only in the classroom. So classroom one fourth, instructions, uh, um, homeworks, et cetera, one fourth, interpersonal or group projects, one fourth, and life, one fourth. This seems to be a good summary of this learning. And this is what I would like the future of on learning, online learning to be. And let me kind of summarize the last slide, okay? And why, is it, why did I choose this particular uh, topic, the missed opportunity? What I found was that at least in India, there are 100 million students who are practically learning everything online. The good thing is, thanks to the, our online, the learning was not interrupted. Otherwise, it would have been a disaster because so many people missing a one year and so many people not learning anything, they would have created a lot of ruckus. So in that sense, we avoided a catastrophe. At the same time, this is my personal lament that this huge, amazing lab that was available free has not been researched enough. And I would even kind of, just to provoke you, even the research questions have not been raised. Forget about actually doing the research. I think we all got so busy kind of getting into Zoom or um, Microsoft Teams, et cetera, et cetera. And then there was a schedule. So we just went ahead. And of course, there were a few interesting experiments. Madhav did something very interesting sending out the lab kits, etc. But I think what we did not do is we did not study. What is it? What worked? What did not work? What worked for whom? What did not work for which? Okay. I think those are the kind of stuff. And I personally feel that we need to do an interdisciplinary study. And it is just not a technology. I find that a lot more discussion happens about how 5G can help, how low-cost devices can help, how um, a specialized uh, package of internet from the telcos will help education. What can we do with uh, specialized devices? How can Samsung manufacturing tablets in India can help education? We seem to have got infatuated. And this is what my take would be, you know, NPTEL is supposed to be national program on technology enhanced learning. I think it has become a technology in big letters and learning in small letters. Can we move to a technology is important, but technology not necessarily getting as much important, but learning getting much more of an importance. And I think Triple ITB is an unusual institute, so we do have an excellent mix of uh, tech techies and multidisciplinary people. Maybe something can start right here. And I think this is what I just wanted as part of the Samvad. As I said, this is not a talk. 
this is basically a set of questions okay which to kind of provoke you and then have some meaningful uh, dialogue okay and as i said in the beginning i don't have answer to any of them but i just thought that we need to kind of start questioning them and uh, i think my last appeal is that uh, sanjay also mentioned about it Ram, rajak kumar also mentioned about it it's also important that when everything becomes stable and uh, to quote what sanjay said when we are um, blessed enough to be able to go back to the classroom okay at that time we should just not go back to whatever we have been doing we ought to learn from this and see how the learnings can be put to bit better use because i don't want this to be a forgotten 18 months and then keep doing whatever we have been doing i think we ought to do something much better and uh, i also find that even at a personal level in my last two, four, six months or so many of the lectures i use this particular format instead of making it to a long uh, monologue kind of stuff for 30 minutes 40 minutes i interspace it with uh, this kind of sh short snippets of course uh, it has its own problem sometimes the video does not deliver and apologies if the video has not delivered consistent quality of audio but that is beyond me and uh, so thank you and i am open to questions let me look thank at a chat box with the other any yeah so questions. thank you professor sadagopan yes. okay uh, there is a comment from strinath okay okay does does he mean there are no or cannot be any teachers endemic to africa siberia yes. bangladesh sorry i don't have an answer strinath <laughs> thank you professor sadagopan for the nice talk and it's a wonderful any questions yeah, yeah. yeah. so professor uh, strinath you have the question uh thanks professor that's no not exactly so i was just uh, uh, commenting on the first video which uh, came up but there seemed to be a underlying assumption that teachers have to move to some place uh for education to happen and uh, uh that also seems to be a little bit more uh, more prevalent that uh, somewhere education has to come from somewhere out there somebody has to deliver it to them and so on mm -hmm. so i was wondering uh, uh, in a more uh, as a more philosophical note you know are we bringing education or are we fostering education that is uh, that uh, uh, can cannot education be endemic to each and every subculture each and every part of the world and uh, does it have to be brought from somewhere and, and so on. so so that was the kind of uh, question i had i think excellent point shrinath i completely agree with you because you know that education is edu i call it a, is a discovery process where the teacher and the students do it together you know so that is how it has been so i completely agree with you i have find some uh, okay hand raised by roland Pop, roland Pop, yeah yeah this is roland thank you yeah. very much for you yeah. know this very inspiring talk because there are many dimensions of the, this online learning that you uh, kind of talked about um i would like to start with one particular observation i have made to share um i've seen there's a particular danger also in this online education people sit too much in front of the computer now the students sit the teachers sit and this movement you typically have in the class or moving from one classroom to the other that's completely missing so i think we also need to maybe think about the dimension of physical education moving mobility and online education we kind of interleave and mix that because otherwise we'll also face a lot of health issues because of too much of sitting in front of the computer then i have a, a question regarding what do you think about subjects different subjects and the uh, ease to bring them online are all the same or would you say some subjects um are easier to you know transfer to the online mode than others and what do you think about age groups um uh, from you know when we look at primary education to undergrad postgrad or professional education is there a difference about um how you know online teaching and e-learning would cater to these different age groups okay i think roland i think you have an excellent point i think there are uh, serious issues of uh, you know even at the individual level we all feel that uh, at least i find that this i strain stare you know staring at you know i end up doing some 3 4 hour meetings so it is definitely a strain and i am sure that uh, even from a posture point of view i think it is important the other thing which you talked about i think this is part of what i call research question somebody has to ask 
it might suit some age groups some it may not suit some age group but much more important it may do some harm to some age groups i think that is something which we need to study and ensure that it does not happen uh, i think that is something which i do feel okay thank you thank you thank i'll you. ask our professor balaji to speak now he is yeah in- yeah uh, uh, thank you professor uh, and uh, i have a couple of uh, questions that i or, or observations yeah the first is that you know while we are talking about online education and so on to me it seemed like more an intensification of what was already going on earlier in the sense we would talk about the very different manner we would talk about how students you know go to the internet pick up stuff come and sort of you know sometimes plagiarize and you know use things because in the sense they were already learning to use uh, the internet and in a sense it was becoming integrated into our education whether we liked it or not in yes. ways that we didn't quite uh, anticipate right so that is that's one side of the uh, story so in the sense of how does it actually fit into this continuum this is something that i would like you to respond to the okay. second thing that i would also like to sort of raise here in a sense related to what roland said but not quite the same thing is that how does it affect different disciplines see one of the things that i find is see when i was an undergraduate one of the things that we did or even other things even if at the graduate level there are certain things where you have to touch and feel right for example you go to a carpentry lab or you go to uh, do certain things which you actually have to get a physical sense of like when you when we did as an undergraduate we did building construction we did certain things that you don't do online and these day many of these things you do with just autocad drawings right where you did just don't get a sense of what it means to uh, you know when we, we we sort of translate things onto a physical site somewhere or we have to do you know interviews nowadays as a social scientist I have to do interviews doing them virtually is not quite the same thing so the whole question of how is it that this experientiality which i think is extremely crucial to what uh, uh, you and strinath refer to as fostering education rather than simply sort of uh, regurgitating something from the textbook and then you know uh, you know spilling it out in the exam the next day is very crucial and i think that's another balance that i think that uh, you know i would just like you to comment on about how what what your what your opinion is and how, how we can sort of think about it uh, thank you balaji i think both are excellent questions the first one you see it is interesting this is where i think people like you should actually start uh, uh, kind of talking about it uh, particularly in the university education all the powers that be whether it is the political bosses or the secretaries or even the industry captains they all seem to think that at least for the university education internet is a done deal so they think that look okay while i do think that lots of people are struggling and people are not even listening if we talk to them they immediately come back to me and say professor you are too old you go out and see even in the remotest places everything is there so they assume that it it can be a safe assumption which i don't think but you know that is something but i think much more important is the second one this is not something which has been addressed well and you know just to kind of provoke i find that even the premier institutes the iits the iits etc we have still not addressed this well because there are lots and lots of things which can't be done i see rightly said simply from the textbooks and the websites so which would actually need getting out maybe doing experiments talking to people doing surveys etc which uh, does not fit into the complete online format how do those courses fit into this online is something about which not much is being even talked about i think that is the reason why i felt compelled that we have not learned this is something which we have to so honestly i don't have an answer but my feeling is it should start and then we should clearly dis- designate that certain courses are going to fit online much better and certain courses are not and in those cases we ought to do we ought to have plan for different things and uh, you know things are not even being planned for that i think that is my lament okay so sorry balaji i no. all that i can do and i join you but i don't have an answer okay no no i agree with you professor thank you so much it's just that i've been so frustrated this thing with all yeah, my yeah. research that yeah. it has been a problem thank you no yeah but balaji i agree that one of the reasons why i chose this topic is i want many of you to kind of uh, you know hopefully the the so called the the real sad part of covid will be behind us once it happens i think we need to do because you see there is actually an attempt to bulldoze this online education and you know already people are talking that you know i happen to be 
the chair of Karnataka's vision group on higher education. Everybody says that, look, we should be able to have gross enrollment ratio, double the gross enrollment ratios simply by technology. Why can't we teach that, et cetera? I think people are confusing lectures with education, at least in the university. My feeling is lectures are an important part of it, no doubt about it. But education is just not lectures alone. I think uh, I would want many of you to kind of uh, talk about it. Thank you. Professor Sargupan, I will hand over to Professor Das. But before that, I'll just ask a question from the YouTube uh, live chat. Yeah. I think this is, if I'm not mistaken, Pavitra Ashok is our uh, alum. Uh, yeah. she asking uh, what would be an equivalent to peer learning in an online setup okay so it's interesting see part of peer learning on online online learning is possible but you just need to have a lot more so again see one example i am familiar with is upgrad because i've been helping them so what upgrad does is that you have you form online groups of people and then you are, have a mentor assigned to you and then you know you have a shared space so think of it as if you are meeting over a cup of tea in a room, you actually meet in a, one of the Zoom rooms, okay? So to some extent, that part of peer learning, where all that you need is to be able to meet with each other and share some notes, okay, that part of peer learning is very much possible online. What is not possible is what Balaji referred to. You have to go maybe to your field, maybe do some actual experiments, maybe as he said, construction site, maybe do a soil testing and come back and you know share your experiences, do a survey photogrammetry and share, that is not possible. Or maybe interview people and come back, so social science kind of stuff, that is not possible. So limited peer learning is possible, okay? But uh, not all of it is possible. I hope I answered your question, Pavitra. Can, can I make a comment? This please, is, please, please go ahead, <laughs> Prabhu. Yes. What comes out of the whole thing is that to learn properly, you have to dwell on a topic, dwell on it in different ways, really, for a long enough time. Otherwise, you really don't learn. You know, you displayed those well known, you know, curves, uh, how we forget and so on. So, importance of going back and you know, this, this this aspect is so important, as a matter of fact, for proper learning, that uh, a conclusion that comes out of it is that really you cannot have a syllabus loaded with things. It has to be very limited. Otherwise, you really will not be able to learn things properly. What I find is uh, uh, that, uh, you know, three hours per week and 14 uh, weeks, you you cover a fact book with a huge amount of material, a lot of theoretical stuff, a lot of mathematical stuff, a lot of other kinds of analysis stuff, and so on and so forth. And you expect that at the end of the semester, the person would have, as a matter of fact, it takes a huge lot of time. For example, electromagnetic theory, you cannot rush through this. It takes a lot of time to really understand and digest it. So are we it, it's not really a question of online and offline. You can do online all kinds of things. You can do offline all kinds of things, but it's important to provide for this, dwelling on a topic for a long enough time, dwelling in different ways, you know, interacting with, with uh, other students, with, with your instructors, all kinds of things, experiments, field work, whatever, you know. Unless you have these aspects embedded in our education system, really you cannot expect a good education. This is just an observation. Okay, thank you. I think excellent observation. And Professor Prabhu, you would have seen Sanjay actually uses that little graph to actually show how yeah. you know a very hastened uh, a kind of learning actually leads to an equally fast. Uh, disappearing also. So he also talked about space to learning. So I think it's yeah, good. But Thank my you. Complaint is, but my complaint is about loading the syllabus with all yes. kinds of things. Obviously, yes. you cannot do justice. This yes. is my point. Yeah. I, I think of, we fully agree. Thank you. Uh, Malpaka and Prasanna, I think I see the hands going up. So in any order? Uh, good afternoon, you, sir. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, I have been... Uh, thinking of an idea uh, for uh, for underprivileged areas okay 
uh, say for example where even the best of the degree colleges in sciences or in engineering do not have lab facilities properly i yeah. think this is a problem across the state right. why not uh, say government take up and create a one full fledged lab in the headquarters in say in a major uh, say district headquarters and time, on a time share basis many colleges share that lab why is it not a feasible idea okay uh, okay so thank you i think it's an excellent point uh, you see shiva you know that many of these things have been tried but i think they have not been uh, dealt in sufficient depth you know the inter university consortium at pune okay is actually for at the high end you know very high end equipment how universities can share what you are talking of is at the maybe the pre university level or the bsc level you are talking the district level there has been what are called the district level um, education some centers i forget exact term so some of these things have been attempted but not enough but you know you see i can kind of tell you also a part of my lament mm -hmm. sometimes what happen fancy things get the attention of the powers that be these are not fancy enough okay. you know that they i think they don't get the attention that is what my feeling would be i could be wrong but maybe others will have some uh, answers but uh, okay so that is what my take is it is it is, it is immensely doable but it doesn't seem to get the fancy of the power set be because one such location can be maintained with uh, all the proper uh, say even even in pandemic times one such location can be maintained with more care right uh, that was my thought so no, you see what i'll do is i'll connect you with there is a group which is working in government of karnataka mm -hmm. so i'll connect you with them let us try i think there's no point trying again you know so okay so i think it is definitely worth trying and uh, of course you know uh, thanks to the net and all you know other things also become easy earlier even coordination you know people are afraid of the bugbear of coordination but you know you can put a small app to coordinate so life becomes much simpler okay okay okay, okay. Thank, thank you, you. Uh, professor shridhar Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much for an insightful talk. Uh, one just um, one observation from the continuing education program that we have been doing, right? As Sanjay said, uh, we use uh, video uh, lectures so that the, the uh, you know the learners can reinforce the, the, their learning. But one of the things they really want is to uh, do some kind of a problem solving session, right, with the faculty on a on a live session. So, uh, in fact, what I think is our responsibility. If I go to the mode that is suggested by Sanjay. Uh, if we go that way, then in fact we have to pay a lot more attention uh, to you know to, with the with the learners. Right? So, for, for example, I mean as Sanjay has pointed out, if you go to the class only, the classroom time is the amount of time that is taken from the faculty. But if you want to address the last four, like mentoring, you know, creativity, and you know, and uh, uh, these kind of uh, four four uh, issues that he has pointed out, we need to spend a lot more time. Right? It is not just the classroom time, and therefore. Right. Uh, we have to sort of apportionate uh, that particular time if you go into this particular mode. Yeah. No, uh, Stider, I I completely agree. I think this is where I think as a faculty groups we all need to kind of put our heads together and raise these points. I think somewhere along, you know, I can tell you that you know people are even asking this question. You know, we have been using this ratio of one is to ten, one is to fourteen, one is to twenty faculty. Now people are saying that look, because it is online, can we not make it one is to three hundred? because the whole emphasis seems to be we can show a number called gross enrollment ratio which is very fanciful from 30% it can go to 60% not realizing what is there as a matter of fact with online if you want to deliver so you can act with online and with more effort you can deliver much more so you can much make much better students so the emphasis should be on getting much better education much higher quality of education much better students far more intense learning but i think numbers seem to be catching the fancy of the people and then you know they somehow assume that quality is given deal you know which is not there so that is where i wanted that to be raised thank you yeah so uh, what uh, the question is uh, can we ask uh, industry to co-op to teach That is, industry can offer the material and opportunity for hands-on work 
but it's not so good for uh, delivering lectures and theory. So oh, the, it's always yeah. welcome, but you see, one has to be a little careful. Sometimes what happens is with, uh, uh, you know, sometimes industry wants to include their material in the curriculum. So those are some of the stuff which we need to be a little careful. Okay, so as long as they are kind of open-ended, because the academic institute should be vendor neutral, so we shouldn't get into too much of endorsement of a vendor product, etc. As long as it is not there, I think uh, it is definitely welcome. Definitely. Thank you, Mr. Rao. Yeah, so uh, Shrishti Parashar is asking, in our education system, foundationally, the focus is to systemize and uh, therefore with COVID to translate it with technology and facilitate instead of stopping. But suggested approach is pretty much to overhaul the idea of education itself rather. It's only first step. Cannot it be said that we totally missed, uh, cannot be said totally missed, isn't it? Okay, I think, yes, you know, I agree with you. So you see, remember as it, you see it is a Samvad series, right? So it's all about discourse. Sometimes what happens is unless you provoke, you know, we don't have interesting discussion. Okay. So the idea is that, I, you know, I fully agree. It's not that we have missed out everything. All that I'm saying is we could have done more or we should do more. Okay. So in my anxiety to get people to kind of start rallying around and start working. So I essentially used, uh, okay. I agree with you. It's, okay. It's not that we have not done here. But we could probably do more. But uh, the other question, yes, I think we need to get more focus into education because, you know, that's the reason why I quote that Subhashita. So the idea is that, uh, okay, simply having NPTEL videos, okay, should not be confused as education. In fact, one of my students put very nicely. He said, look, you know, printing the, creating a book bank and giving textbooks free and asking students to go home and think that they have got education. Are you not doing the same thing with online? He said, look, videos are there, you get educated. Okay. So I think education is a, is a process, it's an engaging process where there is a certain amount of intellectual interaction between the teacher and the taught, the student and the teacher, whatever you call it, the learner and the person who is helping to learn, I think that must be brought back into the central focus. So that is what is my main point of this Samvad. How do we ensure that the powers that be, the decision makers, the authorities, the, uh, you know, the, the agencies involved like UGC, et cetera, AACT, see the point that it is a great opportunity for us to look at the education holistically and don't get, locked, don't get lost that by simply giving the tablets and 5Gs and uh, connections will what have improved education. All these things help education, no doubt about it. But I think a larger point should not be forgotten. So that is my lament, okay? Thank you, thank you. Amit Prakash and uh, Meenakshi have related points. Uh, so uh, uh, Amit says, thank you, Professor, for an insightful talk, given a higher focus on learning and lesser on technology, perhaps standardization too. What should be the role of accreditation and rankings? Uh, and Meenakshi is also saying something uh, in those lines. Really wish NAC and other similar organizations get this important difference. Thank you, Professor. Focus on learning is the way to do. Okay, so thank you. Thank you for your comments. You know, let me use a simple analogy. You know, so I come from a very traditional family. So in traditional families, we make a distinction between what is called karma and what is called prayoga. Karma translates to duty. Prayoga translates to ritual. So often we are cautioned that be aware that don't mix up rituals with duty. Rituals are important, that is the way by which you, but I think the duty is much more important. I think the same thing has happened. I think accreditation agencies, ranking agencies, you know, funding agencies, etc. I think they all have gotten into the ritual and possibly they have forgotten their broader duty. And uh, of course, they are the big bosses who are we to kind of tell them. But my own feeling is that ultimately they're all our own senior colleagues. But I think if we engage with them and we start also creating enough, I think we also need to create enough intellectual material. So maybe 
get some research work done, write some position papers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Hopefully, it will reach their eyes. I think possibly what happens is once again, you know, as I said earlier, uh, things like a 5G, things like um, a laptop for everybody, a laptop for a child, etc. So these are all things which seems to carry some fancy. And uh, the authorities get carried away by that fancy, but you know, it's part of life. So there's no point complaining about it. So I think we need to do our work. So I think we need to create enough intellectual material for them to go and go through because that is also missing. Because you know, I think it is not sufficient to say that we should focus on education processes and just not on, on technology, but we should probably say that, look, what is the impact of it? Where has it worked, where it has not worked? Okay, so I think a lot of time people think that if 100% online classes have taken place, so you think that great education has happened, which is not. So we need to have measures to kind of measure it. I think, I think our ability to create a compelling argument that education needs a much deeper focus will convince the authorities. That is, I am an incorrigible optimist. That's what I hope so. Okay. Yes. Thank you. I will work with you. So if uh, we, we can do something to that. So Mohan Ram has asked, we have still a lot of infrastructure woes, internet being slow, etc. Leading to big disappointment, what to do? Uh, following question, 70% of rural students are struggling to get online mainly due to internet speeds. Any solution to this, sir? When we ask students to respond, they don't. Then hearing that we called his or her name, they come back and say that there's a power cut, headset not working and raining, etc. Internet not available. So I guess, yeah. Yes, so okay. do you have any comments? Or yeah, you see, I have the full empathy. I, I know the difficulties, you know, even we don't have to really talk about rural stuff. You know, if you go maybe 15 kilometers away from Bangalore, sometimes you do have internet issues and sometimes people have power issues, et cetera. And that is another thing which I wanted more research to be done. Because what happens, we tend to think that painting everything with the same brushes will solve the problem. So maybe for a reasonable amount of time, we will continue to have people who have better access to net, better access to electricity, and people who do not have. So how do you make things available is something which we need to address. This has not been addressed. I'm sorry. I think I fully agree with you that you have a point. I don't have a solution, even though things have been improving. So honestly speaking, some of us would have never believed that this level of um, internet penetration and this level of internet delivery would have happened. So we thought that the networks possibly will not take the load. But luckily, I think the networks have taken reasonable amount of load. But there are lots of problems. And, uh, you know, this is a larger country level problem. And, you know, there is something called Bharat Net, which is supposed to have been rolled in by 2019. But, you know, 2021, we are still another year and a half away, something like that. Luckily, power situation has improved considerably, I think, but in the last two, four, five years. So we do hope that things improve, but uh, there is no magic van. So we just have to learn to live with it. And I think all that I would say, we should have the humility to accept because sometimes, you know, sitting on the chair, you know, the vice chancellor, director, or a minister, or secretary, we all tend to dis be dismissive of problems. Okay, we do hope that uh, such arrogance does not get in our heads. We should continue to be uh, hum humble enough to appreciate the problems. Sorry, I don't have a solution. I only agree with you. Thank you. Chandrasekhar has appreciated uh, your thoughts on online learning and the focus on, um, you know, improving quality of learning rather than quantity of learning. Uh, Yagnik uh, has asked a question. Sir, as a student, I have observed that uh, activ activities of plagiarism and cheating has increased drastically during online learning. As the time moves on, people have started believing that cheating is a new normal because they see some people getting success by cheating, whether it's academics or placements. I think it's an important problem, topic to think about. Think yes, uh, Yagnik, I can't agree more with you. I, I also share with you something which is very unfortunate, but this is something which uh, the country should take note that uh, earlier, you know, a lot of plagiarism, et cetera, copying, the students who used to, take, uh, take 
that all root happen to be students who are having performance issues who are being kind of having poor grades etc but as one iit professor recently found out that during pandemic the best of the students have taken to plagiarism and copying so very unfortunate but uh, all that i would say is that this is something we the techies don't have an answer we need uh, balajis and vidishas and amits and uh, others the social scientists to kind of come and help us okay because what happens is that uh, the techies are actually building more and more put more cameras more ai that we seem to be running in that direction but i think we need to kind of step back a little bit those things also are important but i think we should ask some basic question what makes people to copy may what people what makes people to cheat okay i think we need to address them and then i think this is something which is still an interdisciplinary work right now it is viewed purely as a technology solution so can we get better cameras can we have better ai algorithms we seem to be running in that direction we possibly need to kind of step back that is also important i'm not saying that's not important but we should also look at the other side but once again i'm sorry agni sorry to disappoint you i have no answer but i fully agree with you it's an important point but i think enough people think one once enough people think that it is important it will kind of get the attention due attention and hopefully people will find a solution yes professor thank uh, you pose another allo on youtube has mentioned that from his experience having studied from reply tv he feels that his interactions with the professors and working with fellow students was more significant compared to just the learning technology okay so then, thank you okay meanwhile i'll just uh, read out what tirthankar has said learning yeah. can be enhanced more meaningfully using technology like uh, ar vr and ai ml supplemented with online mode the same nptel lectures can work wonders with students across um, with better application of technologies the covid impact has helped in better access to content but perhaps maybe not in uh, greater learning so thanks for the interesting insight professor okay so thank you the tanker i agree that ar vr has not been explored enough for education it's mostly it has been for entertainment but we do hope sometime education also will get the attention of ar vr so okay, and uh, let prasad das take over his his he's been waiting as well yeah. thank you uh, thank you professor sadak gupta for such a wonderful talk particularly the focus is on the uh, learning so and more over that the brains i uh, uh, the neuroscience people's presentation of professor sanjay's thing was very interesting and so thank you professor for your time and also the giving answer to the questions and so professor jaya thanks and so we will close the session uh, professor with your permission we are closing the session and okay. thank you thank you jaya thank you um, yes. professor das and the director and the dean chandrashekar and all our colleagues thank you